Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Mr. Farney Earth Science video. In the last video, we spoke about relative dating and how we can use different rules, different laws, and different principles to get a pretty good guesstimate at the relative ages of rocks that appear in a sequence to one another. Again, I stress, if you were still confused about rock layers and things like that, go back, watch the video again before you watch this video on absolute dating and fossils. So where relative dating focuses primarily on putting events in a specific sequence, first, second, third, fourth, and so on and so forth, it doesn't actually identify their actual age or time in which they were around or how old they were. That's what absolute time is or absolute dating is we are using a specific methodology to identify the actual age of an event or the actual age of some sort of fossil or rock material. And we use two different types of dating methods depending the type of material we're dealing with. If we're dealing with a material that is more than 60,000 years old, we use something that's called radiometric dating where we use some sort of radioactive element or radioactive isotope to date how old rocks are. Radiocarbon dating is a similar method, but instead of using a random radioactive isotope of our choice, and there's several you can choose from, radiocarbon dating uses carbon that is contained within the organic material that we are studying, whether it's plants, animals, fossils, things like that determine how old that material is. There's other ways to determine the absolute ages of things uh, that are in a much smaller scale. Like I know everybody has done tree rings when they were younger counting the tree rings to see how old that tree is. Ice cores, we can use pollen to get a little information about how old stuff is. Uh, but primarily when we're dealing with absolute ages on a scale that is thousands of years, these methods of counting tree rings and things like that, of ice cores, not as accurate. We don't have any trees that are 600,000 years old sitting on the planet. So we have to use another method to age things that are really old to get a really good idea of what's going on in the past. So the prime example for something that's organic, something that's in the last 60,000 years or so, it's called carbon dating. And we use carbon-14 as our marker. Now, in nature, most organic material has carbon. I'm a carbon-based organism, but that's carbon-12. Carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon that's a little bit unstable. You'll get more into that in chemistry. But just know that when we're dealing with carbon, and we're trying to use carbon dating or radiocarbon dating to figure out how old something is, we have to look at the ratio between how much carbon-12 is in that organism and how much carbon-14 is in that or organism. Because carbon-14 is unstable, it'll begin to break down over time. And that time it takes for the total amount of carbon-14 in an organism to go from that total amount to half that material is called its half-life. And for carbon, it takes 5,730 years for one half-life to occur. So how can we say this in simpler terms? If I have 100, that, that's a bad 100, but bear with me, 100 carbon-14 atoms. And after 5,730 years have passed or one half-life, we will have 50 carbon-14 atoms remaining. If we were to go to a second half-life, we'll only have 25 remaining because then that half-life, we start with 50, we'll go down to 25. After another half-life, we'll be down to 12.5. And then you're kind of getting the picture how every half-life, we lose half of that total amount of carbon-14 in an organism. Now, that carbon-14 is changing. It's being reduced. The carbon-12 that's in all of us, it stays the same over time. That's not going to change. So scientists compare the total amount of carbon-14 to carbon-12 to figure out how old stuff is. So you're not going to need to know the mechanism between half-lives for our test. Just know that this is kind of the process that scientists use when they're trying to date how old organic material is. And it's important because once we start figuring out how old fossils are, 
in different rock materials, we can then glean how old that rock material is. It's pretty great. So carbon-14, radiocarbon dating, it's a really important process that scientists use for dating things. We'll pause there for a second so we can catch our collective breaths. That was a lot. Okay. Fossil time, lot simpler. Fossils, scientists use them to figure out what the history of life was on Earth before you and I were around. So we use fossils in combination with relative dating, in combination with absolute dating, to get a really good picture of what life on Earth was during different periods of time in the past. With the dating methods, with fossils, we can get an idea of the organisms, we can get an idea of the time in which they were around. We can get an idea of the tectonic features that were going around in different parts of the planet. So it really starts to fill in that geological time history book that we're trying to get to in this unit. So what is a fossil? The remains of stuff that was here before. It can be shells, bones, wood, or different random traces that have been left over from previously existing organisms that are preserved in the Earth's crust. They show us, you know, wide variety of life forms, which most of them are now extinct, going all the way back to our bacteria that were existing during the Precambrian, all the way up to present day. So they span three and a half billion years or so is the oldest fossil all the way up to uh, present day that we can use. Where do I look if I want to find fossils? Fossils are most likely found in limestone, in sedimentary rock. Because of the nature of how sedimentary rock forms, and we'll get into this more in January when we do geology, sedimentary rocks forms in layers, blankets over time, and eventually a blanket of rock cements into different types of sedimentary rock. The main primary one where we'll find most of the fossils is gonna be that limestone. This slide right here just speaks a little bit about the importance for original preservation of plant and animals. You got to make sure that that plant and animal hasn't changed too much since that organism has died. Like the image here of like the trilobite on the left and the nightmare fish, as I like to call it on the right. Both of these preserved very well in uh, some type of stone. But you'll notice that it's not the squishy parts that have remained. That stuff has kind of decayed over time. It's the hard stuff that's left behind, like the bones or the shells of these different organisms. They are the remains of what that organism was. It's the hard stuff. The squishy stuff breaks down too easily and it's very hard to get a fossil out of that material. Right here, this slide, it just talks about two different ways that we can have fossils form, either mineral replacement, or recrystallization. We don't have to worry too much about the specifics of those right now. Just recognize that most fossil types happens when we start kind of changing the components of either uh, the bones or the shells in some sort of way. Different types of fossils that we see frequently, one's called a mold, one's called a cast. A mold is a hollowed out impression of the original material. This is like an imprint in the ground or an uh, imprint or an indent, if you will, in the ground of something that was there in the past, whether it was like a footprint, a paw print, uh, an imprint of a wing, something like that. It's something that we could fill in with plaster and get a like three-dimensional look of what that organism looked like if we were to fill it with plaster and then remove the plaster. A cast completely engulfs whatever it was and it fills in that mold with some material to take a similar shape of the original organism. So on the left here, how we have kind of almost like a three-dimensional representation of an ancient plant, that's a cast. And on the right here, where we have this ancient shrimp imprint, that's a mold. So if we were to take some sort of plaster material and fill in that imprint, we could get like, and pull it out, we could get like a three-dimensional imprint of that shrimp. So. Cast on the left, mold on the right. We can use certain trace fossils to help us 
better understand a little more information about the organisms, like how it lived, where they moved, how they obtained food. And there's two different types of traces. We have direct and indirect. Direct traces are like uh, different types of imprints. They are like teeth of the organisms. They are like maybe bone fragments, uh, feathers, skin, anything like that where it's a direct chunk of that original organism that gives us more information about how it functioned. And it can be indirect, kind of like the main one is petroleum. If I find a whole bunch of petroleum in one area, then I know there's a lot of organic life living there in the past. So we have direct traces, things that are much more tangible that gives us a lot of information. And then indirect traces that are like, yeah, there was probably some organisms here in the past. We don't have too much kind of obvious evidence of there, but you know, indirectly I can tell. So trace fossils, direct and indirect. Index fossils, this is uh, something geologists use. It helps scientists determine the age of rock layers in which they are found. So if I find a fossil in a rock layer and I use my absolute dating methods to figure out how old that fossil is, then I can say, well, if this fossil in this rock layer is 75 million years old, then the rock layer surrounding it is also probably 75 million years old. So index fossils are really important to help us gauge and figure out how old certain rock layers are. Because then if I'm in North America and I find that one fossil in that rock layer, and I go over to Europe and I find a similar fossil in a similar looking rock layer, I can say both of those organisms probably live during the same period of time. So we can start kind of building the story globally based on these different index fossils that scientists study. This slide right here is probably the most important slide in the whole fossil unit, the prerequisites for fossilization. Number one, has to have a hard part. Need a shell, need a bone, need something strong that will withstand the test of time. Two, you got to stop decomposition as early as it can. It has to be buried quickly to stop it from decaying. You need to cut it off from oxygen so it stops that decaying very quickly. And then number three, it has to be preserved in some way, shape, or form, whether it's dried, buried, frozen, coated in tar, sap, stagnant water. However you want to preserve your fossil, it's got to be done quickly. So here are your three parts again. Has to have a hard part, got to stop decomposition early, and preservation in some way has to occur. We spoke about this slide earlier on, where we're going to look for fossils, primarily in sedimentary rocks. Sometimes they can be found in volcanic rocks, very rarely. And then again, metamorphic rocks too, but sometimes because of the nature of metamorphism, they can be either destroyed or distorted in metamorphic rocks. So if you want your golden standard for finding fossils, go to the sedimentary. Here's a slide that kind of breaks down where we find the different types of fossils over time that help scientists begin to separate off these chunks of time into different eras and periods based on what organisms were the dominant one of that period of time. So the oldest fossils are three and a half billion years old and they're mostly unicellular organisms like algae and bacteria. Then we move into the chunk of time that was dominated by shelled organisms. Then we move into our big chunk of time that was dominated by vertebrates and primitive fish and things like that. It wasn't until only about five or 10 million years ago that we found the earliest human-like organisms, and only 15,000 years ago where modern humans began to appear in our geologic record. So fossils can take us almost all the way back to the beginning of Earth's history, but it's not just fossils. If we get a fossil, that's great, but without the methods found in our absolute dating, our radiocarbon and radiometric dating, to give us the exact or pretty close to the exact ages of these fossils, we wouldn't have been able to figure out the time periods in which they were existing. So it all kind of works in tandem with each other to kind of build toward this overall story about what life was like on Earth millions and billions of years ago. So in our next video, we finally get into the good stuff. We're going to get into and talk about the first eon of time, the Precambrian. We're going to plow through 4.1 billion years worth of time or 90% of Earth's history in one video. And history teachers only wish 
that they could do that. So stay tuned, come back for that. We'll have a good time. If you have any questions for me, please reach out, let me know. If not, have a good rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Take care.